I've embarked on a seemingly impossible journey to build the fastest, the most compatible, the best, the ultimate and utterly unnecessary computer for retro gaming in DOS, Windows 3, Windows 98 and Windows XP. Why would you even do that you ask? Well, cause I wanted to know if it can be done. I wanted to build something that would handle pretty much everything retro related in one package without the need of removing or replacing anything for any game. All the hardware needs to work under DOS, Windows 3, Windows 98, Windows XP and maybe even Windows 7. Except for the ISA sound cards, they won't work under Windows 7 and Windows XP but there's simply no way around that. There has to be an AGP slot on the motherboard, at least two free PCI slots and at least two ISA slots that are able to assign DMA to a connected device so I can use ISA sound card. There has to be a floppy drive connector and I'd appreciate some SATA connectors. Since it's supposed to be the ultimate computer, naturally I want the most powerful CPU available. The CPU of course depends on a motherboard, so let's kick up with that. It was rather hard to find down what's the latest possible chipset I could use. There were a couple of problems I was facing. One problem is the board needs to be able to assign DMA to IC device. Without that you won't be able to use sound effects in DOS games, only FM or MIDI music. Theoretically the latest chipset I could use is Intel G41 or Q35 for core CPUs. Unfortunately there are only two motherboards with IC slots that support DMA. It's Portwell Ruby 9719 and Intelopa IM7930. The problem is the boards are on Optanium, also they don't have floppy connector, at least the first one. They have PCI Express slot for graphics card which won't work in Windows 98 properly and they've got only one ISA slot so they're out. The next most powerful chipset is Intel 865 or 875. These chipsets can handle Pentium 4 for socket 478 or Pentium D for LGA775. They're able to assign DMA to ISA devices, they use AGP slots and still have floppy connectors, so this is basically what I want. The most powerful CPU that can be used in socket 478 is Pentium 4 Extreme Edition 3.4 GHz. I can still do a bit better and there's Pentium D965 for LGA775, it's also extreme edition but running at 3.73 GHz. Pentium D is nothing else but two Pentium 4s in one package and I reckon it's the first dual core CPU from Intel. Sure, AMD Athlon 64 from the same period was probably a faster CPU but there are no motherboards with ISA slots for the system. Well, motherboards for LGA775 with ISA slots are not exactly abundant either. After some research I found only a handful of boards I can use, two to be exact. One of the boards is iBase MB865 which hasn't shown up for sale for at least two years anywhere, the other board is DFI G7S620 which I've got. It's got four memory slots unlike the iBase which has only two but iBase has one more usable PCI slot. And yes, you can see well, both boards have four PCI slots, but this little gap here is what makes all the difference. Cause when the ISA slot on my motherboard is populated, you can't get any PCI cards in the neighboring slot. This board has set a controller, so I can use new hard drives, such as this one. I was actually thinking about using scattered drive, but they are too bloody noisy, I would need another PCI slot and of course they are not as fast, even though this board SATA controller is old and can't make the best out of the SSD drive. The second SATA port should be used for a Blu-ray drive, but I'll probably use one of the parallel ETA connectors. For this, the Pioneer just has to be there, it's a cracking little slot in drive. Now the memory is a bit of a problem. Mainly in DOS and Windows 98, Windows XP and Windows 7 support a lot more memory than my motherboard can handle which is 4GB so there's no problem there. Windows 98 is a different story though. Even though it supports only up to 1GB of memory, the problem can be solved quite easily, I'll show you how later on. DOS has a similar problem, it supports up to 64MB of RAM, it will run with more but some programs simply won't work. There's a simple solution for this problem as well. The most powerful VGA card that has been made for a GP slot was ATI 3850 or 4670. Unfortunately there are no drivers for Windows 98 so I took out one level down which is GeForce 7950 GT. 
Unfortunately, there are no official drivers for this card either, but fortunately, there are some unofficial fan-made ones. Unfortunately, after I installed the drivers, the card was unstable and crashing all the time, so I had to go another level down, which is GeForce 7900 GS. Unfortunately, it's the same type of GPU, so there are still no official drivers, so I had to use fan-made drivers again. And unfortunately, it was behaving erratically as well. So, another level down it is. This time, it's ATI X850 XTPE. Long story short, for this card, there's an official driver and the card's working perfectly fine. To make sure all games can be played, I had to include a 3DFX card. Two cards, actually. Specifically, two Voodoo 2s in SLI mode. I'll be able to play any Gloid game in Windows and almost any Gloid game in DOS. I'm not gonna use this interconnect cable, I'm rather going to connect one cable to the 3DFX and the other to the ATI card and switch between inputs on the monitor. Now the sound card. It was a bit difficult, I was sort of split between two setups. First duo was Gravis Ultra Sound Extreme or Plug and Play plus Sound Blaster or 32 and the second one was again or 32 plus Ensonic Soundscape S2000 instead of Gravis. Gravis has a cracking wavetable, however its compatibility is, well, rubbish and it hasn't got any other benefits. And since I've got only two slots to work with, I need to populate these slots with something sensible, so Soundscape it is. What's sensible about Soundscape you ask? Well, this is gonna be the ultimate rig in it, and as such, I need to include Roland MT32 of course. The problem is the MT32 needs MPU-401 to work. Pretty much every single ISA sound card has an MPU-401 compatible connector, but its implementation is not perfect, it's called UART mode. To make the long story short, with the UART mode, the MT32 won't work in, in about half of the games it's supported in. The original MPU-401 uses so-called normal or intelligent mode, and that's what the MT32 needs to work perfectly. And this is the reason why I'm gonna use Ensonic Soundscape. Unlike the rest of the ISA sound cards, its MPU-401 implementation is perfect, and with the S2000, the MT32 works in every single game. Moreover, the S2000 has got an excellent wavetable and sound quality, so it can be used as an additional sound card when it's supported by a game. Speaking of a support, I've chosen the R32 for a couple of reasons. Since it's basically Sound Blaster 16 with an additional wavetable slapped in, it's got pretty much perfect compatibility. In games, you can set it up as the R32, of course, Sound Blaster 16, or any Sound Blaster for that matter, and also AdLib. There are about a billion different versions of the R32. I've chosen one with the Yamaha's OPL3 FM synthesis, which I prefer over ESS, Opti, or whatever other clones. Early sound blasters, namely 1, 2 and Pro, have got terrible sound quality. The R32 is much better. Also, it's got a Wave Blaster header, which is a nice addition. I'm not sure if I'm gonna use it though. Then it's got its own wavetable running on port 620, which I want to use. And lastly, it's got working MPU for one connector, which I'm not going to use since it's working in the UART mode. Apart from the MT32, I'll be using lots of MIDI modules, but mainly Roland SCD70. The SCD70 is for sound canvases in one package. It can use maps from the SC55, SC88, SC88 Pro, and SC88 20. The SC55 map sounds exactly the same instrument wise as the original SC55, but SCD70's sound samples are somewhat better quality. Also, I'll be using it in Windows XP as a USB sound card, which is excellent since I don't need to use another PCI slot. Now I'm gonna set up hardware. The CPU goes here. Let's apply some thermal paste and let's slide a heating on. I hope this one will be enough, otherwise I have to get something better. The VGA card goes to the AGP slot. Two Voodoo 2s right next to it. The S2000, the R32, and the memory goes here. And lastly, the SLI connector. And now, a bit of a finishing touch. To make this ultimate setup really ultimate, I want to use ultimate retro sound system, and that would be this. 
The Yamaha B1 is an amplifier and Infinity IRS Sigma is loudspeakers. Speaking of the memory, the motherboard supports up to 1GB modules and there are 4 slots, you do the math. I'll populate all memory slots but now for DOS and Windows 98 installation I have to use just one slot for compatibility reasons. I've changed my mind a couple of times regarding how many drives I'm gonna use, in the end I've settled on just one. DOS can use pretty much any drive you throw at it, however it can use only 8GB of that drive. Moreover, it's limited to 2GB per partition, so if I want to use partitions as big as possible, I can use only 4. If it's not enough, I can always add more drives later. I'm gonna use this drive, 1TB SATA SSD. I know this is not exactly vintage drive, but I hate noisy environment and this can reduce noise quite a bit compared to a conventional drive. Now let's get to the installation. I want to triple boot this puppy and to be honest, it took me about 2 days to make it work as I intended to. But first things first. I wanted to use Novel DOS or DR DOS, but they were causing problems with Windows 98 multiboot. Bloody Windows refused to boot into anything else than Microsoft crap, so MS DOS 6.22 it is. I'm pretty sure it's got nothing to do with DOS being practically stolen from Gary Kildall in it. The installation is easy and straightforward. You insert installation floppy disk, boot the computer using this floppy disk, type setup, follow the instructions, and Bob's your uncle. I don't wanna deal with this cat, so I've created this bootable CD with everything I need. I'm gonna select the DOS 6.22 and that's it. Now let's move on to Windows 3.11. Again, I don't wanna deal with this cat and this time I don't wanna deal with a CD either, so the CD I've created copies all installation files on the hard drive and runs the installation from there. I'm doing that for two reasons. First, the installation itself is much faster this way and second, Windows remembers the path to the installation files and when it needs to install some additional stuff, it won't bother me with inserting necessary diskettes or a CD. After a clean installation, I usually copy the Windows directory to a backup directory. So in case I'd want to reinstall the system for whatever reason, I just delete Windows directory and replace it with the one from the backup. To install DOS and Windows 3 was quick and easy, now I'm about to enter sort of horror territory. There are a couple of obstacles I need to overcome to install the rest of the operating systems. Standard Windows 98 has all sorts of problems with partitions larger than 128GB. If you need larger partition, there are some unofficial patches out there that may help with that, but for my needs, 128GB is enough. For the installation, I'm gonna use the first DOS partition to make the multiboot as easy as possible and I'm gonna set a large partition for data later. I'm starting the installation the same way I did with Windows 3.11 by copying the installation files to the hard drive. Before that, it's always a good idea to run smart drive, everything goes much smoother that way. Then let's run setup. My installation is modified so it doesn't need a product key or pretty much any input whatsoever. Now the first obstacle is the already installed Windows 3.11, the setup refuses to install new OS when the old one is still present. In that case you either install Windows 3.11 later or just move the Windows 3 directory away from the root of the drive and move it back later. The second obstacle I ran into was the SATA drive. The installation worked just fine but I wasn't able to boot into Windows after the installation, it just got stuck during loading. There are a couple of solutions for that. First, if the BIOS has the option, you can set a SATA controller into a compatible mode, or maybe called similarly. This solution is a bit dodgy, it may work, but it also may not. I tried that with two different motherboards, it worked with the first one, but didn't with the other. The second solution is a bit more complicated. You can install Windows onto a PETA drive, get into Windows, install SATA drivers, copy entire system from a primary PETA drive to a SATA drive, transfer system, set the SATA drive as a first bootable drive and that's it. The third solution is the safest. There's a simple patch utility for DOS. So right after the installation before the first boot, boot into DOS using your installation CD or floppy or whatever, run the utility and copy in file into Windows directory and it boots up and finishes the installation without problems. Another obstacle is an amount of memory. Windows 98 can safely handle up to half gig of RAM, it may work with more but it also may not. For instance, when I tried running Windows with 1GB, it seemed to be working fine, but some games and benchmarks were constantly crashing. So, how to make it work with 4GB to ask? 
The safest way is to limit memory with Hoima Max. It's quite easy, I just had to download Hoima Max and change a config sysline to this. The Windows XP setup is where I set the data drive for Windows 98. Windows XP can see the rest of the unpartitioned drive without problems, so I'm gonna allocate 120 gigabytes for Windows 98 and the rest of the drive for Windows XP. Now I need to set up a boot menu. Windows XP properly detected an old OS and installed its boot manager to the first partition where DOS and Windows 98 reside. To change whatever you want regarding boot menu, you need to edit boot in a file. And this is how it looks like. Right now, it's set up to boot to Windows XP, of course, and Windows 98, which is this line. You can naturally change the titles to whatever you want. Now I need to get DOS there somehow. To make it a bit more difficult, it can't be done in boot any, but I need to edit MS-DOS sys file and add a line boot menu equals 1. After the reboot, when I choose Windows 98, it allows me to use previous operating system, which is DOS 6.22 in this case. So the boot menu is set up, now the DOS drivers and the rest of the necessary DOS stuff. Since I've got two sound cards in the rig, I need to figure out how each card will be configured. The Sound Blaster is there primarily for Sound Blaster compatibility, so I'm gonna take a safe route here and set its address to 220, IRQ to 5 and DMAs to 1 and 5. 620 is the default address for the author, it's a wavetable, which I don't need to change. Since I'm gonna be using Ensonic for external general MIDI modules, I want to assign the default general MIDI address 330 to Ensonic. And that means I'm gonna use 300 for O32. To make sure everything's gonna work properly, I need to assign IRQs and DMAs to ISA in BIOS. Well, I don't need to, but it's safer to do so. Drivers for both cards are very easy to install. The O32 has a simple DOS installation program, you just need to follow the instructions. The Ensonic needs to be installed in Windows 98 first though. The installation program installs DOS drivers together with the one for Windows. I've backed up the installed DOS drivers some time ago, so I don't need Windows, I just need to copy the drivers from my backup disk. The sound cards are set and working, let's connect external MIDI modules. You can use pretty much unlimited number of modules, they just need to be connected to each other with a MIDI cable, using through and in connector. Let's make it easy and connect just MT32 and SCD7 for now. To get the MT32 working, you just need to go to a setup in a game and set music to the MT32. That's it, nothing else is needed. The SCD7 is a bit more difficult to set up if you want to use its SC55 bank that is. The SCD7 contains four different bank sets and unfortunately for Doom Lovers, the default bank set is SC8820. For some reason you can't change the banks physically on the module, either with a button or somewhere in some menu, you have to send a sysx message from your computer which changes the bank. Yeah, it's pretty stupid but there's no way around that. I can send sysx messages from DOS, of course, and to do that I'm using a program called Midicom. Let's say I want to use a C55 bank, so I've created a simple batch file to do that for me. Now I can play pretty much any game. Let's have a Genda at, for instance, Gene Machine. Let's run Sound Config and for the first test, I'm gonna select Sound Blaster 16 for music, which is FM Synthesis and nothing for sound. Run the game. Working, perfect. Now let's quit, set up again, and this time let's select all 32 for MIDI. Run the game again, and now it's all 32's internal wavetable.
Kwet. Set up, and this time, General Mede. Now it's the external MIDI module playing the music through the Ensonic. Set up and lastly MT32. Run the game and now it's MT32 cracking. Even though the MT32 is a very old module, it can sound astonishing, so let's try some games with this bloody thing. Quest for Glory is a shining example of the MT32 sounding astonishing. And if I'm gonna compare it to the Yamaha MU2000 Another outstanding game that can utilize the power of the MT32 to its full extent is none other than TFX.
maybe I should have done this before, but I need to limit memory usage to make sure everything's gonna work properly. Since DOS is a very old operating system, some programs may have all sorts of problems with loss of memory. To make sure everything's gonna work just fine, I'm gonna use HoimMX, again, to limit memory to 60 megabytes. It's probably the safest way. There are also various programs such as EatXMS that just eats your memory and you'll end up with whatever you need to work with. Alternatively, I can use this option in the BIOS, which limits memory to 16 megabytes, but that's usable only for DOS. I need more RAM for Windows, naturally, and I don't want to turn it on and off every time I want to change an OS. There are lots of DOS games that can utilize the 3DFX Voodoo cards. I wasn't sure whether to use Voodoo 1 or Voodoo 2 cards. In the end, I've settled on two Voodoo 2s for a couple of reasons. The Voodoo 2 is mostly backwards compatible with the Voodoo 1. Moreover, some games work better with the Voodoo 2. The Voodoo 2 is a lot more powerful and it can be used in a SOLI mode with another Voodoo 2 which makes them even more powerful and together they are able to use higher resolution 640x480 versus 1024x768. And lastly, they look bloody cracking together. I always hated Windows 3, it's an unusable rubbish. However, there are some, let's say, exclusives such as Woodruff that I need this garbage for. Now when I think about it, Woodruff was later re-released for Windows 90 something, so Windows 3 will be here just for the sake of being here. Windows 95 had all sorts of issues and problems and Windows 98 pretty much fixed them all while introducing other issues, sure. Nevertheless, Windows 98 was a solid operating system and I fancy it a lot. So for this project I'm gonna use Windows 98 second edition. I'm not gonna use the MT32 or any of the ISA sound cards in Windows 98, they are pretty much useless there. They work fantastic, of course, but I've got the Roland SCD70, which isn't just a MIDI module, but also a full-fledged USB sound card. The ATI X850 is the most powerful graphics card for AGB slot that has official and properly working driver for Windows 98. Combined with the two Voodoo 2 cards, I can play literally any Windows 98 game, prioritizing ATI, of course. To be able to play games, I need to install DirectX and the latest version that works on Windows 9 to 8 second edition is DirectX 9.0c from December 2006. Windows XP hasn't got drivers for ISA sound cards, I don't need them anyway, I've got the Roland SCD70. I'm not aware of any game for Windows XP needing a MIDI sound card, so the Roland MIDI bit is useless here for gaming. Latest supported DirectX is again 9.0c, this time from the year 2009. There is, however, some DirectX 10 compatibility pack, which allows games that require DirectX 10 to work. I was wondering which one of these systems is faster, so let's fire up some benchmarks. According to 3D Mark 2000, Windows 9 to 8 is a tad faster, so if the game is working under Windows 9 to 8, it's better to play it there rather than in Windows XP. Also, Voodoo 2 SLI can't even begin to hope for any sort of comparison, it's been trampled to the ground, but that was obvious from the start. Moreover, Voodoo 2 doesn't support either DirectX or OpenGL under Windows XP, only Glide, so it's basically useless there. Now everything's set up, everything's working flawlessly, so let's play some actual games.
I'm quite chuffed with the final rig, it's really what I was aiming for. The only final adjustment will be better boot menu and config says and auto exec. And that's it, take care and I'm going to play some games on my ultimate build. Bye for now.